it's literally straight from last year's exam, as many of my practices are. Um, sometimes they're maybe two years ago, whatever. My exams float. I don't care. They're out there. I don't collect them. Everybody gets to keep them, use them. Don't forget the Curious is having a review session tonight and tomorrow night, right? I believe. I'll get you guys ready for the exam. And they already contacted me about what to focus on. So I think uh, if you can go to that, would be great. All right. So we got the following arithmetic operation. How many sig figs we report in this answer? Now, I don't consider this a math problem. I can just consider this sig figs because the math is just adding. So, um, and uh, so what do you, what do you do here? What's the rule? You can put this in your calculator, of course, but you're going to want to make sure that you get the right number of sig figs. So this is actually a chapter one question, which a lot of these are because this was designed to be an exam one practice. The best thing I like to do is to add them up like this. Oops. You add it up, and remember, you got to truncate it. That's the rule right there. So it doesn't even matter. You don't have to do the math. Your answer should be what? Two sig figs. Okay. And it'll be a 36 probably, right? Questions on that? This is chapter one, so you all should be pretty comfortable with this by now. Okay. Which of the following, if we're good on that one, which of the following is not a common ion? Yes. Uh, iodine. iodine negative two, and that's correct. Why? Well, we haven't gone into this much yet, but I did give you a chart of common ions. And one thing we'll learn in, in the next chapter, especially, is you know, electron configurations. But you look at iodine, it's in group seven, it's a halogen. And what we tend to see is elements in that group tend to pick up a single electron to get the complete octet. If you remember this from your high school chemistry or whatever, you don't need to know that now. You just need to know the ones in group seven tend to be minus one. The ones in group six tend to be minus two. The ones in group one tend to be plus one. The ones in group two tend to be plus two. The ones in group three tend to be plus three. We get a little iffier as we get to the center of the periodic table. Group five tend to be minus three. Okay. So that's all you need to know. You don't need to know why right now. Um, if you don't remember that from high school chemistry, we'll tackle that. So um, what's your first name? Carter. Carter. So Carter's correct with iodine. Two minus iodine would be one minus typically, not two minus. Questions on that? Master, thank you. And I've, we've got I've got students in all my classes with with COVID right now, so <laughs> need to be diligent. Question three: The deepest point in the Mariana Trench is approximately ten point nine kilometers. Mariana Trench is the deepest um, space on the Earth. It's it's actually deeper than Mount Everest is high, so it's the the um, how would you say that? Swallow it live. <laughs> yeah, so it's deeper than, than Mount Everest. So let's convert it to feet and we can compare it to Mount Everest. Okay, so we have 10.9 kilometers, right? Let's put down what we have, right? And then we want to know what it is in feet. That's all. And we've got a conversion there of miles, feet, and kilometers. So you're following our dimensional analysis, right? We can convert that and say, you could do it in two steps if you want. Um, one mile is 1.609 kilometers times 5,280 feet in one mile. Looking at your units, of course, kilometers cancel out and miles cancel out. Someone or a couple people do that calculation for me. Let me know what you get. 
35,000. So Mount Everest is what, 29, I think, just under 30, 29 something. Questions on that? That's a math problem. That's a conversion. Just being diligent and taking the necessary steps and making the conversion. Um, yes. No, you'd be provided this is taken straight from last year's exam. So yes. Yeah, you're not expected to memorize conversion factors. You are expected to memorize within the metric system, not going to tell you that there's a thousand millimeters in a meter that you're expected to know. What do we have to do to miles conversion? You don't. Yeah, you don't, you don't need to. I just said you can do it in two steps just to, for people that maybe see it a little bit easier. So you're just saying put 5,280 feet in 1.60 in kilometers, right? That's, that's fine. And that's what I would do if I was just solving this. I wouldn't do it in two steps like that, but I wanted to show you kind of the sequential steps but no you could do 5280 feet in 1.609 kilometers because that is a conversion factor it's just that you usually don't see that conversion factor and i don't necessarily owe I, well that one i guess i gave i expect people to know the, the british system the english system i don't usually give 5280 feet in a mile or i'm not going to give you 12 inches in a foot <laughs> or three feet in a yard i expect you know that um now, maybe, you know, things like cups and ounces, you know, sometimes I got to stop and think, how many ounces in a gallon again? You know? All right. We good? Which of the following represents the largest mass? So this is just looking at it. Um, this one's not too bad. Some of them can be a little bit tougher when they're closer together, but this one should jump out a little bit. Which one of those is going to be the largest? I guess it's not jumping out. <laughs> well, what's 0.25 kilograms in grams? 250. So how can 250 nanograms be bigger than that? Or 25 micrograms or 2.5 grams or 25 milligrams, right? So if you look at that one right away and realize that's 250 grams, that's the largest, obviously. Questions on that? Which of the following statements is false? Atoms of different elements cannot contain the same number of protons. The identity of an isotope can be determined solely by its mass number. Atoms of different elements may have the same mass numbers. The different isotopes of an element are not always equally abundant. The identity of an atom can be turned in solely by its atomic number. Which one? Um, Part of. Agree with that? The second one, Carter says. Yes, a lot of people shaking their head. Correct. That's true. Just remember that mass number is the top number. So for like carbon 14, that's the, that's the mass number up there. Well, there's nitrogen 14. So you can't use the 14 to identify an isotope. And we'd said the, the atomic number, the number of protons really identifies an element, right? Um, atoms of different elements cannot contain the same number of protons, of course, because that's what makes the definition of an element, right? Um, this is the one we said is correct. So that was wrong because we're looking for the false statement. Atoms of different elements may have the same mass numbers. Yes, we just said that. And the different isotopes in element not always equally abundant. Well, that's obvious. We've been doing calculations on that. The difference of, of abundance. So two is incorrect and therefore the correct answer. And always catch yourself on that because I know students come up to me after class taking exams before we had a pandemic. They say, oh man, Dr. G, I, I knew that. And you read it, you read it, you say false, and then you go through and, and, and you pick one that's correct because your mind usually is looking for something that's correct. You gotta reverse that. Just don't catch yourself. Read the question again. All right. What value should be reported for the total mass of these three samples of iron weighing? Whoops. 117, 
19.43, All right, so we've got a three here, we got a four there, we got a three here, we got a five there, here. We got 15, 22, two down, carry the two. 32.5343, so what would we write? <laughs> Do you wanna revise your answer? 32.5 and then grams, of course, per unit, okay? You good? Oh, did I miss something? I'm sorry. Yeah, that's Oh, that's 117. So I forgot the other one. Yeah. Um, so we got three. Oh, yeah. So that's carrying. Five, 22. Two don't carry the two. So 42, right. 140. Thank you. Okay, so same thing. Now we still got one decimal place. That's it. Thank you. 142.5 grams. Just truncate it. Okay. Questions? Eat for each of the elements below. There are only two naturally occurring isotopes. Using the atomic masses on the periodic table, identify the pair in which the heavier isotope is the more abundant one. So which is the correct answer? Anybody, people might have looked at this before today's lecture. How are you gonna do this? All of them except for, the, well, not all of them, but the first three are two apart, 79, 81, 63, 65, 85, 87. And the last two are one apart. Yes. Right, did you come up with one? Yes, very good. So exactly what you said, what's your name? Abigail said, was basically look at the periodic table, look at the average mass there, which is the atomic mass, and pick the one that is going to be exactly what we say, heavier our step is the more abundant one. So if you look at rubidium, let me get my uh, pointer out. Actually, let's do this. I have a periodic table here somewhere. And of course, no, I don't. Where the heck is my periodic two? Heck. Oh, that one doesn't have atomic masses. That's completely useless. Uh. So This one's terrible. You can't even read it. I can't believe all the periodic tables I have that I don't have. Oh my God. Drop box. Let's take a look at the periodic table here. Okay. And back to here. Let's say find rubidium um, right here and look. Rubidium is 85.5 roughly. So 
So that's going to be closest to the 85. That's not what we want. Let's go to copper, which is a pure transition metal, 63.5 basically, which means it's closer to the 63, not the one we want. Bromine over here, 79.9. So that's still closer to the 79. It's almost exactly in between, but not quite. Boron, um, 10.8. So that's closer to the 11 than the 10. So there's your answer. And the last one was nitrogen 14 and 15, and nitrogen is right at 14. So that's your correct answer. Okay. Okay, let's do an isotopic calculation here. Weapons grade plutonium consists of 93% plutonium 239 with a mass of 239.0522 AMUs with the remainder being plutonium 40. What is the average atomic mass of this sample of weapon, weapons grade plutonium? Assume the percentages are exact. Okay, so how do we set this up? Someone other than Carter? <laughs> how do we set this up? Right. Point four? Why'd you say point four? 93%, you said, so you said 0.93, right? Right, but zero cent, right? So we've got, uh, what's your first number? Houston said, start out with the 0 0.93 from the 93%, right? Divide by 100 times its mass is just 239.0522 plus, now the other part is 7%, so total is 100%. So seven divided by 100 is 0 0.07 times 240.0538. And that should give us our answer. Which one do we get? I think it's, I remember correctly. Which one? Which one? Which one? Fourth one, correct. That's what I remember too. Yes. How did you get the point? Uh, the total has to be 100%. And if one of them's 93%, the other one's 7%. And 7 divided by 100 is 0 0.07. So you can only do that if there's only two isotopes, obviously. If you have three isotopes, you have no idea what the other two are. You just have to know their total. But... Other questions? Now take that from at home. And we said the answer is this. So take that problem at home and, and solve it backwards. So you're ready for an exam. So then say you've got 239.1233 is equal to 0 0.93 times two, whoops, 239.0522 plus 0 0.07 times X, right? You could solve for one of the masses, or you could do it again and solve for one of the percentages. Just get comfortable with your algebra, solving for any of these. Now that you have all the answers, you can make many problems out of that. That math's a little bit trickier because you've got to, you know, isolate the x. You've got to, you know, of course, subtract this quantity over to here and then divide by the 0 0.07 to do that. But still just, you know, um, basic algebra. Okay. Questions on that? Which of the following does not show a correct relationship between units? This one we did already. It's the exact same one we, I think we did in class. Is that right? Remember it was this one? Don't want to spend time doing that again. Okay. Is it, am I correct? Did we just, did we do this? No one's shaking their head. I'm almost positive with this. We did, right? Because I remember going through this. I think it was on a slide. Does anybody 
have a problem with that one? It should have been one microliter is 10 to the minus six liters to make it correct. Okay. How many grams of water would contain 6.54 times 10 to the 24 hydrogen atoms? Now we get into chapter two calculations and you really understand moles and, and Avogadro's number, you can do a problem like this. A lot of people are gonna struggle with this. How many grams of water would contain, well, you tell me, whoops, what that number up there means. So for water, it's 18, right? If you add up oxygen, which is 16 and two hydrogens. What does that 18 grams mean? Right, and one mole is how many particles? 23rd. So you know the mass of 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd of them, right? So you can almost set up a ratio. You can do it by dimensional mass, set up a ratio. Oops, where did I go? Um, we got 18.02 grams. Sorry, we don't need that. Up there. Is 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd particles, right? That's supposed to say particles. <laughs> and you want to know how many grams is 6. Point... Okay, so this is hydrogen too. It's the other thing you got to be careful of. Not water. It's not asking you for water molecules. So I'm going to do this. Particles of water. What did I do? How many grams? Oh yeah, 6.54. 6.54 times 10 to the 24. So we gotta get a factor of two in there too. Hang on a second. Water molecules. So you'll have, do it like this. So many ways to do this problem. I'm gonna start over. We'll do it by dimensional analysis. So, okay. So we've got um, eight, whoops, 18.02 grams, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd particles of water times two hydrogen for every one water times um 6.54 times 10 to the 20 whoops top catch my units 6.54 ah. running out of room here 6.54 i'm going to put it up here times 10 to the 24 hydrogen atoms and then the way i've done it now we've got x grams so we'll have to flip it to get our answer so i didn't set that up great i should have flipped it the other way so you could do it like this 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd Particles of water in every 18.02 grams of, was it O2? I guess it's about O2. 18 grams of water times um, two hydrogen atoms for every one particle of water times 6.54, you can just put this over one, 6.54 hydrogen atoms times 10 to the 20, 10 to the 50, what is it, 24. Sorry. <laughs> There's so many ways you can set it up. That'll get you an answer. The top one will too. You'll just have to flip it. 
Um, so if you have 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd divided by 18 times two divided by the 6.54 times 10 to the 24, what do we get? The number's greater than Avogadro's number, but you've got half divided by two. So I can't estimate that one in my head. The last one, right? Yeah, that's what I remember. Um, let's see. I, try, I started doing it as a ratio. I'm just trying to see if there's an easier way for people to see this. Well, it's just, yeah, and I get that question a lot. The question is first, where'd the one come from here, right? Well, you're just dividing by 6.454 times 10 to 24. So when you do it as dimensional analysis, you have to have one over. Okay, so you put on number in the first form, so like over the 8.02 gram, do you have to have that, or do you just put like 8.02 grams for every one molar Um. Yeah, no, so you'll need, you can do it in multiple steps, but you'll need the, the Avogadro's number in there because you've got particles here listed, atoms. So I wish I had a little bit more room here. I should have left more room. So we can say that one mole is 18.02 grams times 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd, right? Particles of water, I'll just put P because I'm running out of space, particles of H2O for every one mole. Okay, so I can break that into two parts, if you will. So that's more of what we started doing with dimensional analysis. Go ahead, yeah. Like a what? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And would you get the same answer? Yeah. There's so many different ways to look at see this. Can I see it real quick? Yeah. I just feel like it's a more simpler way of like. Well, it isn't though. But look what you did. You did the same thing as me. Only you just coming at it from a different order. That's all. And that's the key is that you find what works for you in your brain. She started with the number of atoms, but you've got the Avogadro's number in there and you got this in there just like me and you got this in there just like me and you got this in there just like me. So she started with the, the 6.54 times 10 to 24 hydrogen atoms, which is fine. You'll, you'll come up with a half a dozen ways to solve this problem. You have to find what works for you. You think about it logically. I would solve this probably two or three different ways each time I thought just depending on the way I'm, my brain's working right at that moment, I just, whatever I write down first, then I go from there. It's not a big deal. If I write something down, I can always, through dimensional analysis and looking units, get to the answer. I might at the end uh, say, oh yeah, I should have done it the other way. It would have been quicker and just flip it and get my answer. Or, But if you're good, you'll, you'll get to the point where it doesn't matter how you start. And, and if you look at someone else's solution, that'll make sense to you too. There's no one way to do this. Okay, yes. One particle of water. So there's two hydrogens for every particle of water. That's what makes the, the question a little tricky because a lot of people won't catch that and they'll just do water and they'll leave out this part of the problem. That's the tricky part of the, of the, of the question. Or you would call it tricky, I would say attention to detail. <laughs> So we got our answer, 97.9 grams. Questions? Just go home and look at it, right? Start writing down or what makes sense to you. But remember, that is the mass of our, that, that up there is the mass of our dozen in grams and it's the mass of a single molecule in AMUs also. And if you remember that, there's a problem if we get to it, They'll show you with a lot of students struggle where to start. It's because they forget that effectively. There's questions like, you know, what's the mass of, of a, a single hydrogen atom? 
and people don't know where to start. What's the, how would you solve that? Let's do it right now. How would you solve that? What's the mass of a single hydrogen atom? And I don't want AMUs. I want it in, you know, grams. What's the mass of a single hydrogen atom? How would you solve that? I don't give you any information. You have a periodic table. That's it. How do you solve that? What's the mass of a single hydrogen atom in grams? What does your periodic table tell you? If I told you the mass of a dozen eggs is 50 grams, what would you do to solve the mass of one egg? Divide by 12, right? You have the mass of 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. Take that mass in grams, divide by 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd, you have the mass of one, right? It's no different. That's all it is. But so many students, can't solve that because they don't know where to start. The math isn't hard, it's just division. But they don't make the connection that that is a, a basically table of masses of dozens. It's just that our dozen is not 12. So if you ask a question for the mass of one, well, you know the mass of a dozen divided by 12, right? That's all it is. All right, density question. Let me erase some space here. Next time I gotta leave more space, it's too cramped. All right, the density of glycerol and of mercury are 1.26 grams per mil and 13.5 grams per mil respectively. Respectively means in that same order, right? The volume of, what volume of glycerol has the same mass as 25 mils of mercury? Okay, well, let's figure out Right? What 25 mils of mercury weighs? What's its mass? And then we can take glycerol's density to figure out what volume is equal to that equivalent mass, right? Does that make sense? Do you see the word problem? Yes, no? Yes? So we've got. Mercury is Hg, so I'm gonna put that there just so we don't get confused. 13.5 grams per milliliter times, whoops, 25 milliliters. And what's that give me for the mass? Somebody 13.5 times 25, 237.5. 337.5 grams, right? That's the mass of 25 mils of mercury. Now, the glycerol. We wanna know what volume, okay, has that mass. So when we say to ourselves 337.5 grams times, I do it as dimensional analysis, I'm going to realize I want my volume in the numerator because that's what I'm after. And I've got density right there of glycerol, 1.26 grams per milliliter. That gets rid of my grams. My answer is in milliliters. I now have the equivalent volume of, and I forget which one, what, what the answer is, but. 268. That's the mill. Does that make sense? Yes, it's going to be a lot more volume, right? I mean, they're almost a factor of 10 apart in density. So you would expect rather than 25 mils, maybe about 250 mils. If you estimate in your head, you think about it logically, I would say, okay, I expect something around 250 mils because the density is about 10 times less, right? It take up about 10 times more of the volume. So I would expect something around 250 mils and lo and behold, it's 268. But it's a word problem. The math's not difficult. It's the word problem where people get confused and they're like, they can't piece it together. Questions? Okay, next one. Calculate the number of americium 241 atoms present in a smoke 
alarm containing 0.6 micrograms of radioactive 241 given to you as the molar mass. When you see number of atoms, you got to say, okay, I'm going to be using Avogadro's number. Okay. So you might want to um, let me I'll post that. I got to make myself a note. I will post a, a constant sheet with a periodic table. And that's the same sheet I give when I have closed book exams on the back of the exam the students can rip off. It has all their constants throughout the semester and it's got a periodic table. So you don't wanna go looking through your book for different constants throughout the semester. So I'll, I'll post this um, and I'll be under Dropbox in that first module at the bottom. Um, Uh, a constant sheet, uh, which has a periodic table. Okay, we're good. All right, so number of atoms. Okay, well, I know that americium's up there. It's, it's atomic number 95, so it's in the... Uh, uh, the uh, actinide series at the bottom. And I know that mass up there, which is on the given to you 241.06 is the mass of Avogadro's number of particles. Well, I don't have that mass. I've only got 0.6 micrograms. So that's basically all it is. You know how many particles are in 241. That one just says 243 because that's the way they do those is that's the most stable isotope because none of those isotopes are stable. So they put it in brackets at 243. So um, that's why you have to be given that number actually. Um, so we know we've got a lot less than that. So we're gonna have a lot less than one mole. And you can think of that like a ratio. I know that mass contains, this mass right here contains 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd particles, right? How many particles are contained in 0.6 micrograms? Just a ratio, okay? I do it more like dimensional analysis, but that's okay. Okay, so we've got 0 0.60 micrograms times, and of course we got to convert that. There's 10 to the sixth micrograms in one gram times, 241.06 grams in one mole times 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. I'm just gonna do particles, okay, so it's atoms, particles in one mole. Looking at my units, double checking, micrograms have been converted to grams, grams converted to moles, moles converted to particles. Makes sense, I'm multiplying by 12, by my dozen, by Avogadro's number which is what I want when I'm asking for numbers of those particles. And I remember 1.5 times 10 to the 15th, but I don't know if that's correct or not. Yes? And that is the correct answer. So I started with what I knew, moved across step by step, Knowing the periodic tables, units are always grams per mole as far as the molar mass. So I convert to grams right away. Use my molar mass, which was given to me to get to moles, and then multiply by Avogadro's number to get the particles. Question. Okay. The gold foil used by Ernest Rutherford in his investigations of atomic structure was approximately one micrometer thick. Given that the radius of a gold atom is approximately 150 picometers or picometers, how many atoms thick was the foil? Did we do this already? No? Okay. All right. So we got micrometers and picometers. So we've got to convert the two or one of them anyway. 
to be the same unit. They're in different units, so we can't do that. Okay, and of course, you've got the foil, and you want to know how many atoms are in there. So if we take the total foil divided by the size of an individual atom, we'll get the number, right? So we've got which one you want to convert doesn't matter to me. So micrometers 10 to negative 6, 10 to negative 12, they're a difference of a factor of a million, depending on how you do it, whether you're dividing by you know, 10 to 6 or, or whatever. So I'm going to just say um, one times 10 to the sixth picometers is one micrometer. That's the way I'm going to do it. You guys need to take some steps to get to that. But the micrometer is the bigger unit. So it should be a million picometers, right? Divided by 130 picometers. That makes sense? Yes. Did I do something wrong? One times 10 to the sixth. Yeah, it looks right. Or you could do it the other way and you could say one micrometer, convert to 130 to micrometers. Doesn't matter. And if you need to, on the side, just convert these to both meters, then do that. Convert your picometers to meters, convert your micrometers to meters, and then do the problem. You'll get a half a dozen different ways in which this is solved on a very simple problem like this, depending on what your comfort level is. And what do we get for an answer? And if you look at this, it's 130 picometers per, per atom, if you will. So effectively get an answer of how many atoms. It's four times 10 to the third, isn't it? The answer? Yes, go ahead. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Caught that attention to detail. I was sloppy. Radius. Okay. So it's going to be 260, right? For the diameter. So we got to divide by 260 instead of 130. Thank you. Good catch. Thank you. And everybody see why we did that because uh, Andrew, right? Caught it. I have an answer in another class. That's why I wanted to call you Anthony. Um, so Andrew caught the fact that that says radius. So we obviously want the diameter, which is 260, to figure out how many hydrogen atoms. And the radius is obviously half the diameter. So I just divided by 260. And I believe we get this. Is that correct? That's pretty thin. Even though, you know, it's still 4,000 atoms thick, but that's pretty darn thin for numbers of particles. This next one, you know, I didn't really cover much. I think your book does a little bit on it. We'll come to it later too, but we'll do it. Um, what is the formula? Is everybody okay with this, by the way? What's the formula for ionic compound form of calcium and bromine combined? Right, that's correct. The easiest way to do this, you take the common charges that you saw and you have to memorize these because you have an open book, open note, you can go to that page on the periodic table that shows them. And the easiest way to do is what they, I forget what they call this, the swapping method or something. Yeah, you just cross, cross swap, whatever, I don't, know if they, I don't know if they actually have a name for it. But remember the, the negative one, like this, just bring the two down here and the one there. And that's how you get your formula. And the reason is because the compound has to be neutral, right? So you need two of the, the one, minus ones to equal the one, two plus. That's why the formula is CABR2. And sodium chloride is one to one because they're both one. Aluminum chloride is ALCL3. Why? Because aluminum's plus three. Questions on that one? Okay. Go ahead. 17. 15. 
if the nucleus of an atom had a diameter of one centimeter, diameter, okay, we're good there, no radius, roughly that of a dime, what would be the approximate diameter of the atom? The radius of the nucleus is approximately 10,000 times smaller than the radius of the atom. So this is really not a calculation, it's just a metric question. So effectively, if the nucleus of an atom had a diameter of one centimeter, so the nucleus is one centimeter, so this is what we're asking here. Here's my atom, here's my nucleus, and it's one centimeter. Will be the approximate, to, and this is going to be 10,000 times that. So it's just 10,000 centimeters. You just got to find the one that's equal to 10,000 centimeters. Right? Which one's that? Well, if you wanted it in meters, it would be what? Bring it over twice, right? It would be 100 meters. Is that a choice? Yeah, it is. There it is right there. So 100 meters. Oh. Is that right? That's a, there's a mistake because it says 10 kilometers. Oh, that's right. That's fine. That's wrong. It's got two kilometer answers. So I thought that was wrong, but no, it's still okay. Yeah, because there's, oh, there's only meters and kilometers. So there's a thousand meters, one meter, a hundred meters, 10 kilometers, and a thousand kilometers. So it'd be a hundred meters which would then wind up being what? 10, 100,000, 0.1 kilometers would be correct for kilometer. And that's not a choice. Okay. Just move your decimal place over as you get comfortable with the metric system. Yes. Oh, there it's, oh my gosh. Again, it says radius. I saw this up here. If the nucleus of atom had a diameter of one centimeter, what would be the approximate diameter of the atom? Oh, okay. The radius of the nucleus is approximately 10,000. Okay, so it doesn't affect it. Very good though, you caught that. Um, they both say diameter up here. But the radius is just half. So the, the factor is the same. If the radius is 10,000 times smaller than the atom, then the diameter is 10,000 smaller. Yeah. Um, then the, the diameter of the nucleus is 10,000 times smaller than the diameter of the atom. So it doesn't matter if you say radius. Now that's confusing though. I just realized that it'd be better if it just said diameter. <laughs> I didn't see that. But the ratio is going to be the same. It's just a factor of two. Okay. Two more. And then I have a couple other questions I've prepared. I got plenty of time. Strontium 90 atom has lost two electrons and therefore has blank protons, blank neutrons, and blank electrons. Strontium is a group two metal. Which are named what? Right, alkaline earth metals. Alkaline metals, alkaline earth metals, and then halogens, noble gases. You don't need to know the chalcogens. <laughs> I don't know if that's the way to pronounce it. Chal chalcogens, chalcogens. I, I never learned that one. And... Are we going to be tested over that? No, with the chalcogens one? I mean, you have to know the, the group. Okay. You just don't have to know the name. <laughs> So strontium is at the bottom there, atomic number 38, right above barium. So your first number should be what? 38. That only eliminates one, of course. <laughs> strontium 90 lost two electrons. So how many electrons is it going to have? 36. And that's the last number. So it looks like we're down to the last two. And then... How many, how many neutrons? 52, because we've got 90 minus 38 equals 52. That's the correct answer.
questions. All right. We good? One more. <laughs> Green light in the visible portion of the electromagnetic radiation spectrum has wavelengths around 550 nanometers. Express this wavelength in meters using exponential notation. You can just do either the prefix with 10 to the nine um, meters per nanometer. Um, I'll do 10, 10 to the nine nanometers in one meter. So you get 550 times 10 to the minus nine meters, right? But we want to put an exponential notation. So instead of 550, I'll go over twice, 5.50. That makes the number smaller. So the exponent needs to get larger. Okay. So I went from 550 to 5.5. So I'm making the number smaller. My exponent needs to get larger. And of course, you could have done it as 10 or, if you will, 10 to the 9 meters in one nanometer. That works the same way. You like to use the prefixes. Either dividing by 10 to the 9 or multiplying by 10 to the neg of 9. We'll get you the same answer. Question. Okay, let's take a look at, I only have three questions here, I believe. First one's easy, not easy, but the first one's not calculation, it's not long to do, the last two are a little bit more involved. We don't have a copy of this. You want to jot this down, it's fine. It's not long enough. The ion X2 plus has 25 electrons. A possible identity for X is. Which one? Cobalt. D is in dog, cobalt. So we've got. 25 electrons, but it's lost two, which means it had 27, which means it had 27 protons, which means cobalt is the correct answer, right? You see that? And they're all right next to each other at the periodic table right there, first row of the transition metals. Question. So you have to realize, okay, well, it had it's lost two electrons. That's what two plus means. It's lost two electrons. Because keep in mind now, when you have an X two plus, that means now effectively it has 25 electrons. That means it must have had now it has 27 protons and 25 electrons. So it's two less negative charges. That's where the two plus is coming from. Sometimes they get students to get confused and say, well, lost electrons, so why does it have a plus two charge? Well, because electrons are negative. It's kind of like zero minus a negative two in, ma in, in math, right? Equals plus two. That's what you're doing. You're losing two electrons, minus a negative two. So you have a plus two charge. And the number of protons has to be two more than that, though. And that's cobalt. You just look for the one that has 27 atomic mass and you're done. All right. Now we got a nice atomic abundance one. And it's the tougher one where you've got to solve for one of the isotopes rather than, well, of course, I'm not going to give you that on the, on the exam because those numbers are given to you up there on the drug table. So here we got iridium, two stable isotopes, 191, which is 190.96 AMUs and 193, which is 192.96 AMUs. The average atomic mass of iridium from the periodic table is 192.22. And what is the natural abundance of 
each isotope. You're not given either one. This is similar to what we did in class for, what was it, silver maybe? I think we did silver. Maybe it wasn't silver. Yeah, I think it was. So there's only two isotopes, right? That have to total up to 100%. That's a given. And when we divide our percentages by 100, we get one. So they have to total up to one, right? So that means we can use x and one minus x for our two variables to define these two. That's algebra, right? Got two unknowns. We got to come up with a way to define it. And we know the total is 192.22. That has to equal, remember, the abundance of one times its mass plus the abundance of the other one times its mass. That's the way you've solved these before. It's just that now you got to do a little reverse algebra. So let's set that up. The abundance of one, it doesn't matter which one I call X. I'm just going to do the first one because it, it's there. So I've got X. That's my abundance, whatever it is. Let's say it's 90%. Let's just Say that's what it would be like putting 0 0.9 there. 190.96 plus one minus X times 192.96. That's the math. Okay. Now you've got to, you know, remember your algebra and solve that through. So we're going to get this is equal to. 190.96x plus 192.96 minus 192.96x. All I did was distribute. Whatever rule that, I don't remember all the names, distribution rule, whatever. I don't know. What they are. I just do it. <laughs> That's what we get, right? So now we can do combine our x's, right? And bring the the, the number to the other side, we're going to get 192.22 minus 192.96. Heck, Dr. D, that's going to give us a negative number. That can't be right. Well, hang on. Once we combine our X's, we'll get a negative number too, and then we'll get a positive number. So you can't get negative here. They're percentages for isotopes. They can't be negative. So that's okay. Um, What's that, like a negative 74? Negative 0.74, right? Um, negative 0 0.74, that's gonna equal what do we have. We've got a negative and we've got two X, right? That's all, just two X. We got negative two X equals a negative 0 0.74. So divide the negative 0 0.74 by negative two. And you have your value for x. And what do we get there? Did I do that? 0.37. So x is equal to 0 0.37. Don't get mixed up now. That's the 191. That's what we want right there. So the other one's going to be 63%. That looks like that is the correct answer, A. Questions? No, no. I mean, there's, there's ones. <laughs> I don't want to uh, mislead you, so. Not, not if you don't know three of them, no. What we could do is, is um, give you the, there'd be three isotopes, give you the percentages, and then ask you to calculate the mass of the one isotope. Question. So I said the very first lecture, algebra and word problems. <laughs> I mean, this is just algebra. You learned that back in, I forget what grade we 
algebra is seventh, eighth, ninth, depending on schools you went to. Um, so it's just algebra. You have, might have to sharpen your algebra skills. I'm not an algebra teacher. All right, so we got our answer. We got the x is 0 0.37. Therefore, 1 minus x has to be 0 0.63. And then convert them to percentages. You get 37% and 63%. Okay, last question. Similar to what I asked you on the spot a few minutes ago. I asked you for the mass of a hydrogen atom. What is the mass of one oxygen molecule in grams? Round your answer to these significant figures. How do we do this? Find them. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you can do that. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's fine. I didn't even think of it like that. But she said, find the mass of one oxygen atom and multiply it by two. Right? That, that works. But how do you get the mass of one oxygen atom? Okay, well, we're going to look at the periodic table. Yeah, the way we had to do it, that those not the number. What's the mass of one oxygen? It's 16 AMUs. We can use 16. It's 15.99. It's 16 AMUs, but we also know the mass of a dozen, right? It's like we did with the hydrogen. So what do you want to do here? What's that? Divide by Avogadro's number, right? So we can do it Houston's way. We can say 16 grams per mole times 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd oxygen atoms in one mole. And that, look at my unit. It's going to be grams per oxygen atom, which is the mass of an oxygen atom, unit wise. Someone give me that answer. Well, no, the answer, we're not done because we have to multiply it by two. We can do it in one step. Let's do that. I would have done it with the 32. That's what I was thinking 32 grams per mole for oxygen. I do it like that. Houston decided to do the two, the uh, sixteen, which is fine. So, whoa, the heck is that? New to me. All right, um, and then times two oxygen atoms per one O two molecule. So we now have the mass of an O two molecule. You want to do it by dimensional analysis like that. I would have just used 32. Yeah, Abigail, was it? Yeah. Good question. Uh, yeah, you should start to know that. Um, but this one, it didn't really matter because I had this. That's just spurring the question in your head, I guess. Um, yeah, you should start to know that. And it's pretty straightforward. It's group the halogens, right? And then in addition to that, oxygen, nitrogen, and hydrogen. I'm not forgetting anything, am I? Halogens, oxygen, nitrogen, and hydrogen, the ones that form diatoms, two atoms bound together. What do we get for an answer, by the way? Which one is it? E as an Eric? 5.3 times 10 to the minus 23 grams. It should be a really small number, right? It's the mass of a single oxygen molecule. Sometimes I put positive exponents in there. So be attention to detail, read all of your choices. You know, if I had 5.3 times 10 to the 23rd grams in there, someone's gonna jump on that. Once we get past the fundamental stuff, I tend not to put incorrect answers in your multiple choice. I used to do that. I don't think it's a good practice. 
And the reason is I want you to be working your exam. And let's say we're doing empirical formula. You do all this math and you figure it out. And then I have the common mistake made and I have the wrong answer there. And you grab it, you choose that one and you move on. And you don't learn your mistake. Now, if you're working it out, you're a good student, you come to an answer, you see the answer is not there. You say, wait a second, I did this right. Wait, oh man, I forgot to. And you catch the mistake and you'll never make that mistake again. If you caught it yourself, rather than you coming up after class and saying, Dr. Dave, what I do wrong? And I tell you, and because you didn't do it yourself, you'll wind up making that same mistake again. But for this, for stuff like this, this fundamental stuff, I need to know that you know that this should be negative 23 grams, not positive 23 grams, because the mass of a single molecule, right? Things like that. Or if I ask you the number six figs, and there's three, I'm gonna have one, two, three, four, five, gonna, gonna have lots of wrong answers there that make sense to you. So, but once we get to more advanced calculations, I tend to throw that practice out because then I want you to figure the, the math out because you're doing more advanced stuff. Questions? I'll take any questions you have. We, we still have time, a few minutes. Uh, if there's anything, I've gotten some emails, which is good. Some of you are working some of the problems in the back. Some of you are working even problems and asking you questions, good. Um, finish up that smart work. Yeah, use that to study, use the quizzes to study. Questions in the back of the book, do some more. Go through the slides again, go through the exercises. Good luck studying, reach out if you have any questions.